Jeff Orlowski, welcome back to E Town. Yeah, thank good you. Good to so see much, you. Nick. You look mm -hmm. good. You look like. You have the air of a successful filmmaker about oh, you. Oh, um, uh, if that means being quarantined in my own house, just doing <laughs> Zoom calls all day, that's that's what has been happening, yeah. What does a filmmaker do when you have to make Zoom calls all day? Do you think about the setup and the lighting? Oh, the I, it's funny, we were doing a live event and uh, we finished the tech check and I'm sitting there and I was like, okay, I just basically started set dressing the back of my room as <laughs> if like checking the camera, checking the angles <laughs> and playing with lighting and everything, so. Yeah. Um, I've also, uh, you know, I have my film equipment in my house too. So I was doing podcast interviews with like my chef's microphone, just like rubber banded to a gooseneck lamp. Right. Um, and, uh, just sending, you know, super high quality audio files over to some people. So it's been, That's it's been great. fun. Did you, what kind of a background backdrop did you create for your Zoom stage? Uh, it's, it's in my office now. So it's mostly, oh, okay. uh, mostly books. Uh, I yeah. scattered a couple of awards in there. I was like, what's the right balance of not too many awards? You don't want to show a, off. A couple, yeah. Right. <laughs> did you choose your books carefully? Because that's a big the deal. The books are, in, uh, they're far enough away that I don't think anybody can read the spine. <laughs> so it's, it's a little, uh, I get a pass there, I think. <laughs> there is a solid like Nat Geo section though. There's like a right. nice yellow, yellow shout out there. <laughs> Hey, well, let's start by talking about the transition because uh, yeah. we were we were talking about the last two times you were here. We were talking about your other films, Chasing Ice, Chasing Coral. Um, what led you to this new yeah. subject matter? I think the constant theme always was what are the big issues facing society, um, and what stories did we have access to that we could tell in a unique and powerful way that that are contributing to the human story and contributing to that path forward. Um, I think with uh, with Chasing Ice and Coral, we, we came into these environmental stories and figured out ways to visualize climate change right. in a way that hopefully hadn't been seen before. And then a couple of years ago, I was talking to some friends from college who work in tech, and I was starting to learn and realize what was going on hiding invisibly on the other side of our phones, on the other side of our screens, mm -hmm. and what reality was happening there that um, that the average person wasn't aware of and wasn't seeing. Was there a correlation between climate change as an existential threat and that recognition? Absolutely. I mean, when we started talking about it, I started to realize from Tristan and others in our film, like we are talking about an existential threat here. We're talking about, Tristan says, a climate change of culture hmm. where we have invisibly redesigned the way our society interacts with each other. Um, and that's happening unbeknownst to us in these little rectangular devices that we carry in our pocket all day. Yeah. Tell us about your friend Tristan, because I imagine he was probably the first person you called when you thought about making this film. Well, I, I actually only thought about making the film because I saw him post about this issue on Facebook. I see. So I saw a <laughs> post, very ironically, on Facebook about, hey, look, I worked at Google and this is what I see happening that we're designing and this is what we're doing to people. Wow. And he tried to raise an alarm inside the company and it didn't go anywhere. And then he figured he needed to make it public. Yeah. And uh, after I heard that from Tristan, I called up another friend who was an executive at Twitter and who I'd met Tristan through. So this friend, Jeff Seibert, who's in the film as well. Right. Jeff Seibert became the chief, basically the head of product at Twitter. Um, and I asked him like, I saw Tristan say this stuff, like, what's going on here? Is this true? What's like, is there something here? And, and Jeff's response was, you know, I didn't get it at first. I was resistant at first, but the more I heard him out, the more I realized what he was talking about. Mm -hmm. So Jeff went through his own sort of iteration and evolution and thinking um, to, uh, to kind of advance his, his own awareness about it. Yeah. Tech companies have an interest yeah. and your film reveals this yeah. in keeping us on our screens as long as they possibly can. And they do this by feeding us information that sort of supports who we think we are as people. Right. And it actually physiologically releases a dopamine hit, right. which creates an addiction. Yep. And then they can use our own um, behavior on social media and on the internet to predict our behavior and sell that information to advertisers. I think one of the challenging things is just how many steps it takes to paint the whole picture. Right. And just one thing I would offer as a slight clarification, um, the tech companies claim that they don't use the most exploitative and most um, time-sucking techniques, that they actually back off of that, um, which I, I want to give them some credit for. But even if that is the case, 
there is a direct relationship between our time and their profits. Yeah. Um, and I, this is really the, the the way I think of it. They are funded through an advertising business model, right? So at its very very core, the fundamental thing says. The more data we can extract from you, the better we can predict who you are, the more we know about you, and the better we can leverage that information to sell something to you right. for this advertiser. So these people over here, those are the, our true customers. They're the ones who we're really serving. Yeah. And the more we have the tools and the capacity to give them what they want and to give them the most predictable option of selling a product to a person, whether that product is a physical thing or an idea... That's who we're trying to serve. So the more data they collect about us, the more accurate their predictions can be. And the more time they get from us, the more money they make. Yeah. And that inherently has built out this massive domino effect of what works on you? What's going to work on Nick? If I am here, I'm Nick's algorithm, and I'm going to try to figure out, okay, you have 100 friends on Facebook right now. If I can grow your network and get you to have a thousand friends instead of a hundred friends, I've just gotten a 10x potential increase in revenue because now every time you post something, 10 times more people might see that thing. Mm -hmm. And if you spend 10 minutes a day on this platform, but if I can get you to spend 20 minutes, I can get you to spend 30 minutes. I know exactly what's going to work on you. I know what you love. Oh, you like this guitar. You don't like those guitars. You like these guitars. <laughs> and oh, wait, not that. Don't show him that drum. He hates that drum. But these drum, oh, this amp and that drum, he goes bonkers over those. Yeah. There's no programmer sitting there trying to figure out what's going to work on you. Yeah. But there's an automated computer system that is figuring out just what's going to get your, your dopamine to light up for you. If I gave you my feed and you looked at um, my feed and I looked at your feed, they wouldn't really work on us. Like, right. I don't care about those particular yeah. amps or those particular drums. Um, and you might not care about the cameras that are being shown to yeah. me. Um, and so what works on each and every one of us is, is really, it is completely customized. We think of Facebook or Twitter or Instagram. There's this one word that represents this particular thing. But in reality, there are 2.7 billion versions of Facebook out there customized to each and every one of us. Yeah. We're each in our own Truman Show version of this particular software being fed now for year after year after year, a constantly learning and self-reinforcing series of posts that will engage us. Um, so there is this like addiction component there, um, but really what, what has me the most concerned is how these systems have kind of evolved and learned to give us things that might not be in our best interest. Mm -hmm. So we're seeing consequences on the individual mental health side and we're seeing consequences at the societal side. So whether that is misinformation, fake news, um, uh, conspiracy theories, and political polarization, we've got, we have a breakdown of truth that has happened now right. just year after year as these systems have refined more perfect ways to get you to come back and, and for us to profit off of you. Yeah. And a lot of it's automated, right? This is an artificial intelligence at this point. They're just, Completely. Yeah. Once again, there's no person there saying... Yeah. Let's, let's break down democracy today, yeah. right? The goal was, hey, we can send an algorithm out to grow the network. Awesome. It seems great. We get more people on. We can send an algorithm out to go figure out what's going to keep you engaged. Great. Seems awesome. We can send an algorithm out to figure out our ad load. There's an algorithm that's optimizing how many ads to show you for maximum engagement and maximum revenue. And if we show you too many ads, you might fall off and not use it as much. So we can throttle that back so that your usage goes up. Yeah. I mean, they can control at the end of the quarter, if they haven't hit their financial numbers, they can just throttle up the ad load and generate, as, as we know with Google, can generate $100 million in a couple of days right before the end of the quarter. And then throttle that back down at the start of the new month because we don't want to overwhelm you too much let you be happy again with your mm -hmm. usage. And they, they have that much precision and control wow. over these algorithms. Do you think Google started with some altruistic purpose? Yeah. That it, was, it, did, it wasn't strictly yes. in order to capture yeah. data and Absolutely. sell? Absolutely. Yeah. I, I do believe they went into these, you know, many years ago, they went in with good intentions. Yeah. To the fact that Google, um, the founders of Google, Larry and Sergey, wrote a paper, their PhD thesis at Stanford, said in it, we believe that an advertising business model would corrupt a search engine's intentions, its, its incentives. They didn't want to pursue search. They, mm -hmm. they didn't want to pursue advertising at first. Mm -hmm. um, then during the dot-com bust, when they were struggling to make money, they decided, you know what? 
we need a way to make money and this advertising thing might not be perfect but it seems to be the best option yeah. out there so they made this shift at one point away from their originally stated values and they embraced advertising and the other players just looked at that model with great admiration it seemed yeah. Too good to be true. It seemed so perfect. Right, printing money. Printing money. Yeah. Hey, look, we get to offer this thing for free, and we get to serve these advertisers, and we get to make money. Everybody's happy. It just seemed really, really good. I, I make the comparison to the fossil fuel industry. You know, when somebody discovered oil on the ground, and look at look at what this thing can do. Right. This is phenomenal. No more hunting for whales. Right. We don't have to kill the whales anymore. How great. This is so easy. And we can we can make engines and motors and we can fly. And only years later did we realize, well, wait a second, there are some pretty significant yeah. consequences here. And that same thing applies, I think, to our technology. Yeah. Years later, we've now seen, wait a second, there's a problem here. We're seeing this yeah. domino <clears throat> effect. We're seeing all these consequences. And we have to look back and, and really reckon with the Frankenstein that, that, that they have built. And now they have a system that is entrenched in the stock market. So they can't even easily undo what they have built because of the, the fiduciary responsibility to their shareholders. Yeah. So even if they wanted to just about face and change, change and turn around and be more ethical, they're going to get sued by shareholders. They're kind of stuck in the system yeah. now. So we, we have a big uphill battle around how we change this. Circling back to climate change for a sec. If... Um because, because these kinds of manipulations have consequences. So as I understand it, if I'm a politically conservative person and all of my search engine history and all of the data right. that I'm after is, is very narrowly focused in a very conservative yep. direction, and I plug in the words into Google, climate change is, mm -hmm. it'll give me a different set of answers than if I'm a you know, progressive yes. environmentalist living in Boulder, Colorado, yes. and I say climate change is, those, those answers will be divergent. Correct. And the reason we, being, I'm going to get what I like, and therefore I'll spend more time on the, on, in the search engine? The original concept, the original intent seems so innocent. I'm going to give you what you're looking for, right? That's kind of the hope that they were designing around. Um, there's no factoring in of truth in that mindset. The right. idea was, oh, what's Nick looking for right now? And based on the trends that we can identify over many people in a particular area, if you search, I mean, as, as I've done, I've, I've gone in and VPNed in through an anonymous login, through like logging out and then going in to a search engine in countless different countries, you see the answers in Utah are different than the answers in Colorado, different than the answers in New York, different than the answers in Sweden or China. Wow. And so we did this experiment and we also asked friends, this is actually one of the last things I did on social media was like, hey, everybody, mind searching for this phrase and send me what, you know, what Google gives you. And then we got all this data from all these different people around the world about what, it, what Google offered when you searched for the phrase climate change is. And, and that happens, you know, that's one specific example around environmental values, but the reality there is across any type of value system, hmm. right? So we now know, and we don't go into this in, in the film, but we now know how racist some of these platforms can be, right. that the data that has been fed into these systems is just being regurgitated out. There's a, um, there's a great line from one of our subjects, Kathy O'Neill, who she says, Algorithms don't predict the future, they cause the future. Oof. And it's just a such a massive, you know, <laughs> messes with your head kind of thing. No kidding. Based on the historical data that they're operating from, algorithms repeat the past. So, um, and once again, we don't, we don't touch this uh, in the film, but there are algorithms around um, policing. So police, uh, prison sentencing. So if a judge is trying to figure out how long should I send this person to prison, they're now being offered algorithmic data to say, based on who this person is, we recommend this sentence. Now, unfortunately, that's being based off of historical data that is, as we now know, very, very racist data to begin with. Right. So it's going to give different recommendations based on who somebody is. So, Do you think there's judges who go asking Google Health how long they should sentence some criminal? Well, the, that's not happening through a Google search engine, right? But these are private algorithms that now exist in all sorts of different aspects of life. They're algorithms that determine 
job hiring. Their algorithms that determine, um, you know, as college admittance, uh, as the, yeah. those people are reviewing through the applications, it goes through algorithms as a as a first round. Um, if somebody's doing a job search or if you're hiring somebody, there are algorithms that were helping companies that said, you know what, you should hire people named Jared that play lacrosse. They that we predict that people named Jared and who play lacrosse are going to do better at this company because historically the white men who were named Jared who played lacrosse did well at those companies. So it's just a self reinforcing wow. thing. Yeah. So th those are the types of algorithms that we don't cover them in the film because they're a, a different kind of class and different companies. Um, in the film, we really looked at the social media companies, the companies that are changing and distorting our information ecosystem. Yeah. It's interesting that you found a lot of people who were you know, key players in the creation of yeah. this network who were willing to go on the record and talk about yeah. what they did, how they got into it, what happened, yeah. how they became aware, and yeah. the horror, in a way, yeah. at recognizing that the genie's out of the bottle. Right. Right. And um, in fact, one of them who was with Facebook says he wanted people to know that every action they take online is being carefully tracked. And, um, you know, there's a huge impact I want to talk a little bit about um, youth because obviously yeah. young people are so engaged with social media, so engaged right, with right. their various platforms and right. on their phones all the time. So the mental health of kids, especially teenagers. Right. I mean, you and I grew up in a world before social media existed. Like I remember a childhood where I could be outside, that I could have my own thoughts, that I wasn't right. constantly. Some of the kids that we spoke to in, in the making of the film, one of the quotes that I heard was, you don't understand what it's like to constantly have to be on all the time. Wow. Just this mindset and this pressure. I mean, the way that the these systems have been designed, you know, they weren't designed by child psychologists trying to protect and nurture children. Right. Right. That's quoting Tristan Harris in the film. Um, they, they were designed by for-profit companies to figure out how can we make as much money as possible and and designed with this mindset that, that I think they genuinely believed that their products were doing good in the world. I think they still drink that Kool-Aid in many cases, yeah. that they're providing this great service and look at how amazing it is that, that people have these platforms now. Um, I think we're, you know, we're, we're seeing the truth at this mm -hmm. point in time. We're realizing these impacts. And the ones on teen mental health, um, increasing rates in uh, self-harm and suicide, particularly in young girls, um, the constant body comparison that exists on these platforms, there's literally a number now that kids are growing up with that is kind of their value and assessment of self-worth. When you're constantly being compared to how many likes, how many times was something that you posted shared, um, how quickly are people responding? Um, if you post something and it's not getting an immediate response, people are inclined to delete it and remove it. Like we're, we're retraining an entire generation of humans around a value set of social comparison that, that we don't know what those long-term consequences are going to well, be. We haven't run the experiment. Seems like a sort of systemic insecurity among them. That, that's you a know. great framework, yeah. Um, in the movie, you created a fictional teen Yes. And, um, and you sort of imagine a command center yeah. just for this one kid where his social right. media overlords are going to kind right. of constantly try to keep right. him hooked and right. engaged. So, so that, that's all the algorithms that are doing that, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we worked with a bunch of the engineers to understand how the systems actually operate and tried to anthropomorphize that. We, we yeah. were bringing it to life. Um, there's some people who, you know, have, have criticized that this was a, an unnecessary part of the film. Um, I think it's the thing in the film that has made it so successful. You know, I th um, when I think about how do you make algorithms accessible. It's such a complicated, like I hate using mm -hmm. the word algorithm. People mm -hmm. don't know what it is. It's right. It's a confusing concept, but when you can bring it to life, hopefully people can think about it and engage and respond in a different way. My hope is that, you know, somebody finishes watching the movie and they pick up their phone and they can picture what's on the other side of the screen. Right. Like, wait a second. Why did I get that notification yeah. right now? Wait a second. What is it? Why did it show me this thing right now? What is it doing to me right now? And if an audience can feel that and have that sort of tactile memory, physical memory and relationship with their device, then hopefully it, it can wake them up to how they want to engage with it in the future. Yeah. It's worse than the Wizard of Oz by a long shot. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, I we, we say in the film, like, 
um, if you're in the matrix, how do you know that you're in the matrix? Yeah. Right. We are all living yeah. in our own customized little matrix right now. Yeah. Um, and kind of, it's, it, hopefully the film is like a wake up to like take the red pill and get out of the <laughs> matrix.